Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Vintage Motocross q and I'm your host, Joe Abadi. This week, I saw an interesting bike come up. Well, it's not up for sale yet. But I'll tell you a little bit about the bike, the history of it, and we can discuss, or you can send me your thoughts a little bit later on. The bike belonged to Jim Pomeroy. Jim Pomeroy is someone that everybody adored. He was, of course, the first American to win a Grand Prix in Spain. And during his career, a very special bike was built for him for just a short period of time before his actual Boltaco sponsorship. The bike was known as an Abtaco. And it was put together by a few guys up there in the Great Northwest. Terry Saxlin was one of the people who financed the bike. It was a Boltaco engine built around a frame that was built from aeronautic material. Very unusual. You can see it in the picture here. Linda Pomeroy is someone I've stayed in touch with over the years since Jim's passing, and occasionally she does talk about selling the bike. It came up again in recent conversations. She asked me about the value. I thought the best place to sell the bike would be the Mecham Auto Auction and uh, Mecham Motorcycle Auction in January. I wasn't really sure about the value. I've always had a number in mind, but there's really, really nothing to gauge it by. I listed the bike on one of my other Facebook pages, the Vintage Motocross Buyers and Sellers Price Guide, where I'd heard comments that went from the sublime to the ridiculous. I've heard some people say the bike isn't worth $5,000, that no one would really be interested in it. I've heard other people say it belongs in a museum and it's priceless. When I think of priceless, the only thing I think of priceless are really the health of my family and myself. Nothing else is priceless. Everything else is really worth something. I've also heard prices of $50,000 which I thought was completely ludicrous. What are my feelings on the value of the bike? It is difficult for me to say, but there are a few things that I want to share with you to give you some food for thought. Number one, there's nothing to compare it by. So you can't say it's a factory bike because it isn't. It's not a works bike, it's not a factory bike, it's not a production bike, it's not a prototype. It's a one-off, specially made for Jim Pomeroy. The thing about the bike is that Jim did ride it in one event, and it was a Trans Am. There were 40 of the best riders in the world there, and Jim finished 20th that day. That ride on that particular bike did get Boltaco's interest in him. That's how he wound up with a factory ride from Boltaco. So, considering that Jim finished 20th on this bike, and it was only ridden once professionally, it, it doesn't have, uh, shall we say, a lot of provenance, a lot of history to it, something that could be authenticated. So I don't really see where, where the value of, of, of that comes into play. I tried to think about some other bikes throughout motocross history that were similar to that. In other words, someone taking a production bike and going into a major race with it and doing something really amazing. The only thing that came to mind was the, the, uh, the USGP with Marty Motes on the LOP Yamaha. That's this bike right here. Marty Motes was the first American to win the USGP. He did it on basically a production bike that had some LOP modifications on it. I don't know where this bike is today. I don't really know what I would think the value of that bike would be, but here's a bike that won the USGP. Jim Pomeroy's Up Taco really never won anything, although it did compete that one day in a Trans Am where it finished 20th. The thing that I believe will bring buyers out for that bike is not necessarily the bike itself, but it's the memory of Jim Pomeroy, much like the memory of Marty Motes. Now, not to get morbid with you on the subject, but I think there puts a, 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 certain, oh, a certain mystique over both of those bikes, considering both Jim Pomeroy and Marty Motes uh, unfortunately died early on in their lives. What will the Optaco bring in Las Vegas come January? I may be the person representing the bike there in January. I'm trying to work out the details with Linda Pomeroy now. If it should happen, I'll be there with the bike We'll be with live, uh, with live broadcast from there for Vintage Motocross Q&A, just like we're doing here, and we'll all find out. My question to you, and you can send it to me at Vintage Motocross Q&A in a private message, what do you feel the bike is worth? How do you feel about the bike historically? Where do you think it will end up uh, in dollars and cents? How do you compare it to the Marty Motes Lop Yamaha that won the USGP? 
And that's my thoughts from the starting gate on this week's opening segment. We're going to get on to the questions now. And Susie, of course, is with me, and she will be having, uh, get, getting questions and, and giving them to me if there's something that we really... I have a comment from Justin Conway. Justin he put, Conway. He put in 9,500, but he's not answering me whether he was responding to the Pomeroy virus. Look, I, I don't think $9,500 would do it. I, I'm not going to... I really don't want to get into uh, a conversation here about the value of that bike right now. I want to get on to some questions. You can, of course, put your comments in. Uh, I'm not going to follow up probably with, with answers because it's, it's not something we can really discuss. You can say 9500 Justin. You may not be wrong. Next guy can come in and say, I'll pay 25000 for it. And we're just going to have a bit of back and forth, and we're not really going to get to the crux of that conversation. There can be more talk about this bike down the road, but for right now, I'm going to let it set where it is. I'm going to get on with our questions. Tony Devino. Joe, can you provide some tips on mounting new undrilled fenders? I can do that, Tony. And to do that, I'm going to have to get up off my stool here, get around to the back of my workbench, and I'm going to show you a little bit about how I think something like that could go. I want to thank Jordan, of course, for being here tonight, helping me with the camera work. Drilling or getting a, an undrilled fender to mount to a bike that has forks on it, it can be difficult. There's also an easy way to do it, but something's going to be required. I don't have an uh, undrilled Suzuki fender, so we're going to use this Honda fender as an example. The best way to ensure that that fender is going to fit, your, your new undrilled fender, is to take your old fender, like this, which is already drilled, just like it is here. You're going to put it on top, just like that. Here's the thing you got to keep in mind. You need to look at that fender from every angle to make sure it's lined up perfectly. Make sure it's not twisted even a fraction of an inch in either direction so you know that your holes are going to be accurate. From there, you have the holes in your used fender. You're going to take a Sharpie like this, and you're going to go around and you're going to mark it, just like this. That's the guaranteed way to have that thing absolutely accurate when you go to do that. After that, you can, well, these circles are about seven millimeters. You want to get dead center, dead center on those circles. I like to use a spring-loaded center punch. You get it right in the middle of that hole, and you're going to leave a mark right there. You're going to do that on all three holes. Now, here's one of the keys to making this really work right. When you take your drill, it's a six millimeter bolt that goes in there, which is about this size, okay? You're going to take a drill with a small bit on it, put it in here on your center punch mark, and you're going to drill through. Don't use a six millimeter drill bit when you first do it, and I'm going to tell you why. You're going to drill through there, take the fender, go back to the bike, and put it up there and see if through your little holes that you just drilled, if things line up. You can use a little ice pick, you can use whatever it takes to get through that little hole to make sure all of them are lined up. If they're lined up and everything looks good, Take, your next, take the bit that you need to put a six millimeter hole in here. You're not going to drill it this big yet. Okay, this is about 9 sixteenths. You're not going to drill it that big yet, and I'll tell you why. You put your six millimeter holes through all four of these marks. You're going to put your bolts through there, then go put it up on the bike and see if everything lines up. And if everything lines up from there, then you can make the hole bigger. If they don't line up from there, get as many in as you can and see if the fender's straight. You should be in good shape. It should be straight if you follow the instructions that I've given you. But don't drill it any more than that. Once you see that everything lines up and your six millimeter bolts are all in place, you can go and then drill your bigger holes. What I would recommend to do that is a step up bit like this. 
You can go into your six millimeter hole. This one happens to fit perfectly at what looks like nine sixteenths. That's what it looks like to me. Of course, my eyes are not what they used to be. So nine sixteenths. So you're gonna drill your hole to nine sixteenths, then you can put in your rubber grommets, finish up with your hardware, and you should have a fender that fits your bike just absolutely perfectly. Something to keep in mind. Reproduction fenders are not always exact to what your OEM fender was. Things can be off just a little bit. I've seen fenders come through that have a grid on them where they have all these little squares. Those squares don't mean much. Don't drill into those squares thinking that they actually mean something. They don't. Something else you should keep in mind too. If you have an up pipe on your bike, make sure that the pipe is on the bike when you put the fender on. That may sound funny. It's not. You don't want the back of your fender hitting that pipe. You could be off less than a quarter of an inch and it's going to wind up hitting the pipe. Make sure that thing is on there and you're all lined up in that uh, so, you have, so you have clearance for your pipe. Now, if you don't have a fender, let's say you don't have a used fender for your bike and there's no way to lay it on top of the other one, what can you do? Well, I'm going to give you a little example right here. This is what the bottom of your triple clamp would look like when it's sitting on your bike. You can have holes just like that. But with the fork tubes coming down and everything mounted with the tire underneath it, it can sometimes be difficult to get underneath there and, and get any kind of, a, of an accurate measurement. Here's something you can do. You could take some duct tape like this. You could put it underneath your bike on that triple clamp area just the way you see it here. Take something that's blunt. It could even be a pen. It could be an ice pick. And you're going to poke through the holes that you know are there because you could see them coming through the tape. Okay? So now you know that your holes are accurate by the mark on that tape. You gently take it off and make sure if this is the front that you go toward the front of your fender with those marks. And you're going to put it on there just like this. What I would do from there, because you're not going to have these circles as you did from the original explanation I gave you, then take your Sharpie and mark all four holes. Take it off. Take a good close look at it. Make sure everything's even. It may not be. Wipe it down with WD-40, take off the marks, do it again. You might have to do it three or four times. However many times you have to do it, do it. You know, there's an old saying in the carpentry business, measure twice, cut once. Well, in this business, it's measure as many times as you have to, not to wind up drilling a $70 or $80 fender, or who knows how much. You could have an NOS fender there that was never drilled. Maybe you paid $200 for it. You don't want to make a mistake. That's my tip on drilling a front fender. I'm going to come back around to the other side of this workbench right now, and I'm going to show you a little bit about how I would approach doing a rear fender. Susie, how am I doing so far? You're doing good. All right. As you know, it makes me a little nervous here sometimes. I might have some tips. All right. <laughs> In an application like this, where you're going to be putting a fender on a bike, these things are really, really handy. It's called a quick grip. You can get them at Home Depot. It's real easy to use. And they're great. I've always found them very, very helpful to putting a fender, putting a fender on a bike. Why? Because you can put the fender wherever you want it in the frame. You could stand back, get a good look at it, and make sure it's straight. You may be putting it on a race bike, and where the fender or the rear of the frame could be tweaked a little bit. You want the fender to be straight, though? This is the way to do it. Here's a tip for you as well. Notice over here where the rear brace for the seat is. There's a little gap in there right now. What I would recommend is putting the seat on the bike to make sure it doesn't hit the fender or if there's clearance the way it should be. Now, I'm going to spin this frame around a little bit so you guys can get another look at something else that I think is important if you happen to be using a Preston Petty fender. Obviously, you can make your mark right here. You can use your center punch, spring-loaded center punch, make a mark there. In a situation like this, you have plenty of room underneath here to put your hole and then use your rubber grommets. 
if it weren't like this, and let's say, well, let's just take it off here for a second to show you where you might end up with a problem. Let's say you had the seat or the fender too far back. You can see here where you're not going to be able to catch the screw hole or the bolt hole in your fender. Make sure you leave enough material, depending on what fender you're using, make sure you leave enough material to drill your hole and use your rubber grommets and put things in place the way they should go. I wouldn't be surprised, and you shouldn't be surprised, if it takes you a couple of hours, maybe more, to put two fenders, a number plate, and maybe some side panels on your bike to do it the right way to make sure they're lined up correctly. So, Tony Devino, great question. I appreciate it. Thank you for it, and I hope that sheds a little light on how to mount some fenders that are undrilled on your old scooter. I'm gonna pull my chair back here right now, sit back down. We're gonna continue on with some questions, and if you have any questions along the way, Please send them in. Susie will have them there. She can read them to me, and we'll keep going on with what, you, uh, what you're interested in. Now, our third question is, what is the best way to seal or preserve aluminum? This came in from my friend Rich Clark. Rich Clark has built some incredible bikes. I can think of a Suzuki a Motocross Fox that he built, uh, a few other uh, replicas that were absolutely unbelievable. When it comes to polishing aluminum or, or preserving it afterward, <clears throat> there's a couple of things the average person can do, uh, almost anybody can do. Number one, you can keep polishing it every time it gets dull. Number two, out of a spray can, you can use clear. It doesn't come out very thick, it's not gonna last very long, it's only gonna preserve it for a certain amount of time. If you have the parts off the bike, obviously you will if you're polishing them, you can take them to your powder coater have them powder coat them clear. It's gonna last a long time. The shine's gonna look good, okay? Some other products that are out there right now, and I found one and I read a little review on it. It's supposed to be phenomenal. It's called Protecta Clear. And this is used on not only aluminum, but on brass and, and other soft metals that are polished and keep, people wanna keep that, that brilliant shine to them. Stuff's rather expensive. Uh, even like one ounce is like 15 bucks. But they say one ounce covers five square feet. It's something to consider, and uh, that's, that's some of the things that I would use or I would consider for preserving an aluminum finish. I just realized I read question three before uh, I read question two. So we're gonna go back now to question two, and it's from Brian Ivey. I'm sorry for the mix up, Jordan. I know you work real hard back there trying to get my pictures all straightened out. <laughs> Brian Ivey, were there different shocks available for 73 or 74 Honda Elsinores? No. Same shocks. The 125 and the 250 both had the same length shock. The difference is the 250 shaft was 12 millimeter and the 125 shaft was 10 millimeter. In length, they're exactly the same, 14 and a quarter inches. I think you mentioned something last week about someone saying they had some Elsinore shocks. By the way, their shower shocks uh, is the OEM item for that bike, original equipment manufactured item. Um, I think you mentioned something last week about someone asked you or said they had some shocks for sale and they were definitely for an Elsinore 73-74. Well, it's only one shock that goes on an Elsinore from 73 or 74. Number four, my buddy Retro Francis from Southern California. He feels it is best to use paint as opposed to powder coating on a restoration. No argument from me. I think we've done this show three times already, and the question of powder coating and paint always comes up. There's no question about it. If you're doing a restoration, you want it to be correct, you want to have it painted. The only thing you should go to your powder coater for in that instant is maybe to have him uh, sandblast the frame. And once he sandblasts it, get it right back to your shop and get some prime on it. You want to get that, some protection on that thing right away. During that time, of course, too, after he sandblasts it, you'd be able to get a really good inspection of the frame, see if there's any cracks, any kind of repair that you have to make. Good hearing from you, Francis. Number five, can you discuss some of the finer points of jetting? I'm trying to dial in a new Makuni TM400, and that comes from Tim McGuire. It's, I'm going to say some things here, Tim, and I'm going to try my best 
to enlighten you a little bit. It's not something that uh, can easily be answered. It, it can be answered, but jetting, of course, you have to hear the bike run. You have to know whether the bike is running lean, whether it's running rich, what it might be doing. In this picture are some pictures. Of some uh, in this picture are some jets. You have your jet needle, your needle jet, your pilot jet, your main jet, your air screw. Okay. From closed throttle till a quarter, from starting just to the quarter throttle, your pilot jet comes into play. That's where it starts from zero to a quarter. Once that bike's running and you feel it's running a little rich or a little lean, you have your air screw. You can turn that almost closed, but any more than closed, you should be changing a pilot jet, and you can back it out no more than two turns. Backing it out two turns, the bike's getting more air. It's going to tell you whether it, it wants uh, less air. You might have to go with a smaller pilot jet because you don't want to either turn the pilot jet in all the way or all the way out to compensate for too much, uh, too much fuel or too much air. So that takes care of you from uh, closed throttle to quarter throttle between the pilot jet and the air screw. Your needle jet, you have some adjustments on there at the top. You have a clip from quarter to half throttle. Your needle jet will come into play. You'll be moving that clip up or down to bring the narrower end of the jet up out of the pilot, out of the main jet from the carburetor as you're accelerating. You'll hear some blurbering maybe. Uh, if, if it's running too rich, you might want to drop it. And when I say drop it, a lot of people sometimes get this confused. I don't mean drop the clip. I mean drop the needle. And in order to do that, you're going to raise the clip. Okay? So you want to keep that in mind. And then after your, your, your pilot jet is sorted, your air screw seems right, and, and your, your, your jet needle or your needle jet is good, then from half to full throttle, then you're looking at more of your main jet. And at that point, you're going to, be have, to, you're going to have to do plug readings and, and really ride the bike more to see where, where you're going with the jetting. Now I want to take a sip of water here for a moment because then I'm going to continue on. Jordan, you can further the picture. Do you want to talk about jetting more or do you want to continue on with your question? With whom? Jetting. Do you want to talk about jetting more? Because Brian Taylor has a question about jetting and Mike Connolly says Bing Agency's booklet on jetting. Um, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go through the rest of this, and I should have asked Jordan to further this picture a little bit earlier. It doesn't really matter. It's your, it's your basic Makuni carburetor, and this is where your, your, your air screw is. Um, if we go on to the next picture, this is where, this is where the, uh, the majority of unsolvable jetting problems occur. This is a leak down test tool. When you're assembling your motor, and you've put the whole thing together, you have new seals, new gaskets, you need to do a leak down test. The time to do this is with your ignition off, with your clutch cover off, with the primary gear off, where you could see both, uh, both seals. Jordan, please forward this. Here's a picture of a crank seal, okay? The item I showed you before, the leak down test, you put it on your engine, you pump it full of air. Not full like you're pumping a balloon up. Depending on the size of the engine, you may only go eight or nine pounds. But when you do that, there's a gauge, and you want to see if your engine is holding pressure. The time to check that is when, as I said, you have your ignition off, you have a clear view of your crank seals. You want to take some soapy water, spray around those seals, and see if you have any bubbles. If you do, you gotta, may have to split the case again, get the seals changed, maybe you pinch something on the way in. You wanna make sure you don't have leaky seals like that. So in our next picture, we see here that uh, on this old, well, it looks like a Hodak engine or something, I'm not sure, they've got the exhaust port plugged. You wanna put your top end on, but you wanna plug your exhaust, you wanna plug your intake as well. Make sure these things are sealed off so no air can escape 
and you, you can get a real, true, a real true gauge of if you have some type of leak in your crankcase. Um, this guy's got a little fitting in there, rubber, you tighten it down. The way I, the, the best one I've seen, and, and if you, uh, is, is a system like this. I like this the best because the reed valve is in place. So you've got your head on, he's got it blocked off here at the, at the exhaust, but in the back he's got the reed valve in there and he's got his rubber intake manifold. I like this system because you could have a leak there. And with the other one, like in the last picture, where you just have your rubber plug in there, um, you don't know. When, the, when the, uh, the spigot, the inlet spigot, the little manifold for your carburetor goes on there, that, I mean, that's where it could be leaking from. But with that other system, you can't really tell if that's the way, uh, if, if it's leaking from one of those points. You could have a leak around a base gasket. You could have a leak around a head gasket. It's best to check these things if jetting is really driving you nuts. So, Tim McGuire, I hope that answers your question. It is rather involved in jetting. I can only do so much here. Uh, to explain it to you, but perhaps a light went off in your head and it, uh, it helped you somewhat. Thanks for the question, Tim McGuire. And if there are some other questions coming in... There's jetting questions. How many? Jetting? I'll, I'll do my best to, to, to answer what I can. What have you got? So, uh, Brian Taylor... Brian Taylor. ...says or asks about jetting... Can we hear about fuel octane? I'm hearing that after... 102, there is no more stopping of pre-detonation and you are just burning money. I don't really know the answer to that question off the top of my head. I've said this before on the show. When I go to race, I go to the pump, I get the highest octane possible, then I buy VP 105. So between VP 105 or 110 or whatever it is that I'm able to get and a 95 or 98 octane gas, I mix them together wind up somewhere around 100, 101, depending on what it is. And uh, I, I don't really know the answer to that question, but I will investigate it for you and report back to you next week on the show, and we'll find out more about if uh, we're throwing good money after bad, paying for some real expensive race gas. Any other questions from there, Sue? James Sharp says, I tend to agree, and frankly, I assume to 110 because it's ethanol-free and available. James Sharp, absolutely correct. The ethanol-free gas is what you want to get. There was a question a few weeks ago again on that topic, and Mark Hildebrandt suggested if you can't find ethanol gas in your area, you need to find a place where people have boats on a lake, um, maybe jet skis. People like that like to run uh, ethanol-free gas because of fiberglass gas tanks and, and stuff like that. Uh, Justin Conway. Justin Conway. Yeah, how similar is a Bing 136106 compared to a 54 Bing? I don't know. I've had Bing carburetors before. I used a Bing on, on a, uh, a Can-Am many years ago. It worked great. I never had an issue with it. It had a choke, though. It didn't have a tickler. I can find out for you what the difference is on those two carburetors, and I can let you know next week. Um, Mike Conley. Mike Connolly <laughs> wanted to know, uh, where can he get donkey dick grips? This is a legit question, and there is such thing. They are called donkey dick grips for uh, an obvious reason. They do resemble the appendage of a burrow at, to some point, as, as you can see. Uh, they're available on eBay, Mike, if it's something that you must have. And uh, yes, they are known as the Dunky Dick Grip. Last week also, Mike, you said something to me last week about putting a tire on a roof and letting it dry out. Uh, I, thought, I thought it was an, un I didn't think it was a real question, really, but it was. And some of the flat track guys, in order to dry out a tire, I guess to make the sidewalls less flexible or uh, make the tire a harder compound, uh, some people have laid them in the sun and let them dry out. I don't know how long. I've never done it, but I did want, I did want to uh, validate Mike's question because I kind of poo-pooed it a couple of weeks ago and said, why don't you come over for tea? We'll do some breathing exercises. But you, you were actually right, Mike. Um, there is such a thing as drying out those tires. So Mike also had a question. Um, and here's a picture of Mike on an amazing CZ that he built. It's uh, highly modified. He made so many great parts for this bike, uh, including a fork brace and, and the pipe, and he did so much to it. But 
Mike had a question that said, uh, vintage guys seem to be in two camps of thinking concerning bars, grips, lever, billet parts, tire types, etc., for vintage racing and riding. Um, how do you feel about it? Mike, a guy's got to be comfortable on a bike. You know, you're 50, 60 years old, however old you may be. If, if a more modern bar uh, is, is better for you, put that bar on your bike. And the same thing goes for wider, wider foot pegs. I don't have an issue with a guy modifying a bike that he's going to race uh, with safety in mind. You know, as far as billet parts go, billet was available in 1974. Billet is aluminum. Aluminum was discovered by a Danish fella named Christensen in 1825. Aluminum has been around a while. And so have milling machines. In fact, what really made works bikes so amazing when we looked at them as kids in the 70s? It was the billet parts. It was the machine billet. It was the triple clamps. It was the forks that were turned down from billet. It was the brake pedals. It was all those cool things. So if you want to make billet parts for your vintage scooter today, have at it. I don't see anything wrong with that. You know, I I've said it before. My only problem is when people make certain modifications or do certain things um, to what they call a restoration, and it doesn't really apply to their restoration. So uh, have at it with your new parts and your pegs. And, and I always appreciate your questions, Mike. And I always know when you send me something that says confused and conquered. You're not confused, Mike. I've got a new segment coming up, and I want to talk about it for a moment with you. What we're going to do is we're going to have viewers. Oh, you want this? Well, no, we'll, we'll stick with this. This is good. This is good. If you want your product or uh, part that you're selling, uh, I'm sorry, your product or business. I'm talking about a new product or, or the business that you're in. If you would like it featured on the show, you can send me an email, inbox me at Vintage Motocross Q&A, tell me what the item is, and I'd be glad to put it on the show. We'll talk about it. I'll review it a little bit. I'll talk to you about it. Um, I think it was Robert Fish a couple of weeks ago said, how does he get his uh, Yamaha YZ billet parts on the show? Drop me a line. Send me some pictures of the parts. I'm sure people want to know about it, and I'd be happy to promote that for you. So, yeah, get the pictures into me. I'd be more than happy to put them on. And in turn, for me promoting your part on the show, I'm going to ask something of you. I'm going to ask you to maybe put up a post on your page to promote Vintage Motocross Q&A. Maybe you could share it with your friends, share it in some other groups, and that'll be our, our little quid pro quo, or exchange, if you would. Um, the other thing that I wanted to discuss now, Jordan, we can send us some Facebook messages with photos. Here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to uh, showcase your bikes on Vintage Motocross Q&A. So what I'd like you to do, send me some pictures of your bike, inbox me, tell me about it, and we'll have them up here on the screen. Now here's what's going to make this really neat, I think. I'm not really an iPhone, I'm not an iPhone user at all, but Jordan is. What we're probably going to do is have you call in on the iPhone. We'll have you up on the screen and uh, the bike. And I'll be asking you some questions about it, where you bought it, why'd you buy it, what'd you do to it, all sorts of things. And you can talk about your bike and tell everybody who's watching Vintage Motocross Q&A, you can tell them all about it. So I'm going to make another amount, announcement about it probably during the week. I'll make a little video to remind everyone. And if you have a bike that you want displayed, I'd be uh, more than thrilled to do it. If we have any more questions from anyone that's listening, um, if I can answer them, I'd be happy to do that. So George Lucas. This George is... Lucas from New Jersey. George, this is a very lengthy question. George has a lengthy question for us. <laughs> I don't know if it's a question or a comment. Very Let good. me hear it and I'll decide if... Here we go. Go ahead. Joe, just purchased a 78RM. 100 from Ohio. You purchased an RM100 from Ohio. Go on. Buyer, seller, satisfied. Buyer and seller are satisfied. It's a very nice bike. I decided not to deal with the Toronto seller because he wasn't working with me yep. for payment. I remember that, George. You had a bike up in Toronto and he wasn't working with you on the payment. And he I think it had a. to me. He only wanted bank transfer while I wanted to send a certified check. Okay. Plus, he was dictating to me when he wanted it picked up. He didn't seem to care how much time I had investing in looking for a carrier and broker, let alone having to fill out the forms. I had $300 of my time, really got fed up with it, and decided to walk away. Yes. That's it. Okay. 
So you found the bike in Ohio as opposed to Toronto. You didn't have to deal with customs. You didn't have to deal with the title. You didn't have to deal with a guy who's a pain in the neck up in Canada who's making demands on how he wants you to pay him. If you could deal in America with good old greenbacks, that's always what's best. Especially, you know, with, with things like Facebook or eBay, anything like that. It's always better to deal with, uh, with somebody local. Sometimes you can't, the bike's impossible to find, and you're going to have to jump through hoops to get it. But in this case, I'm glad you found the bike in Ohio, and uh, I know you were looking for an RM100. I appreciate you watching the show every week, too, George. All the best to you. I know you got the uh, swap meet coming up, the Nesco swap meet down at Joe Belazzo's. It's one of the best times ever in, uh, in vintage motocross in New Jersey. I think that's coming up on October 12th and 13th. I won't be able to make it because I'll be celebrating my anniversary with my beautiful wife on October 12th. That's right. 34 years. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, Tom Criscanco. Tom Criscanco, yeah. Did the older bike factories have to destroy the part molds, jigs, and tooling once they discontinued their bikes? I was wondering why a modern company hasn't worked with a manufacturer to reproduce original older parts. That's a really good question. Well, um, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure what, what happens to those molds. Uh, maybe the factories themselves destroy them after they don't need them anymore. There's always been talk throughout the vintage world uh, in the past years about why doesn't Honda re-release the Elsinore from 1973-74. You know what the cost is to make that bike today? I mean, think about it. You're going to have a, a modern 450 out there or even your, your 250 two-strokes, ten, twelve, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000. I'm not saying that somebody might not go out there and uh, buy, buy a re-release of that bike, but for that kind of money, you could probably find a beautiful restoration. You might even find an original bike. Um, I, I, I'm not really sure where, where the molds go. I can tell you a little inside story, though, about a little company in Strakonis, Czechoslovakia, called CZ. In fact, they had their 100-year anniversary just a couple of weeks ago. The person who was working in that factory way back when, his name is Jerry Starsik. Jerry is still building CZs. He has the jigs for the frames and things like that. So a little factory like that um, those jigs, uh, I don't know about molds as far as fiberglass gas tanks or uh, fenders. I don't know if any of that stuff would be available. Um, Mark Hildebrand says they were destroyed because of liability. Insurance. Yeah, yeah, um, for, for, a lot of, for a lot of the, uh, the companies. Yeah. So um, there, was, there was another thing that, was, uh, that had come to mind. Oh, Boltaco, Osa. Montessa, all out of business. They were bought out by Honda. I'm sure when Honda bought them to remove them from the market, uh, probably all the molds from, from, those, from those companies, all the jigs were probably destroyed. So yeah, there is liability in mind, and uh, that's why a lot of them were, were destroyed, just like Mark Kildebrand said. But CZ still got some over in Checo. Yeah. Brian Taylor wants to know is aviation fuel similar to marine fuel? Is aviation fuel similar to marine fuel? I think it is. I don't know what the octane is, but I, I've heard of guys using it. I've heard of guys using it. Uh, perhaps some guys use it because there are airports, uh, small airports closer to them that have aviation fuel than there are places that sell race gas. I, I've heard of it being used way back a long time ago, probably before there was race gas, although there was leaded fuel back then, but uh, aviation gas had uh, more octane even than your, your leaded gas of, of, the, uh, of the 70s. Uh, What's that, Susie? Your watchers. These are my watchers this evening? Yeah. Well, thank you for being here. Ray Bennett, James Sharp, Tim McGuire, Mark Hildebrand, Justin Conway, Wes Seeley, Ken Kaplan. Has anybody looked up New England Motorcycle Museum? Ken Kaplan's got it going on up there. He's expanding all the time. Get online. Go buy a shirt from Kenny. Johnny Nastro, who is LOP, Lawns Offner Products. He was a guy that jumped in the game in motocross in the late 70s, made swing arms and some aftermarket things. He was a, a pilot, I don't know, kind of a playboy type 
got into the motocross game, built some really cool stuff, and then fell off the face of the earth. But I heard he's still out there somewhere. Ah, Lloyd Saberis, Jack Henry Lee, thanks for being here, Brian McGuire, Robin Cox, Justin Cargis, Brian Taylor, uh, along with Mike Conley, and a bunch of other guys. I'm really happy you guys could be... And Brian McGuire related? Who? Tim McGuire and Brian McGuire. Uh, I'm not really sure, Tim McGuire, Brian McGuire. I'm not sure if they're related or not. But I want to thank everybody for being here. And uh, we're going to be doing it again probably next Tuesday at 6. But uh, I'm going to mention something here. I don't know if I'm going to change the time frame of the show, and I'll tell you why. My friend Steve Wise puts on a show at the same time every week. It's called Moto Church. So does Marty Tripes, actually. Both at the same time I do. All three of us are on at 6 o'clock on Tuesdays. Now, because I did not have the illustrious and successful career of Marty Tripes and Steve Wise, more people are probably going to listen to them at 6 than come here and listen to me. I don't know that for a fact, but I don't think I want to get into a ratings war with either one of those two guys. Also, Steve Wise has a thing called Moto Church. He talks about some really great motocross stories for the first half of his broadcast, second half, he gets into the Bible. I think that's a wonderful thing that he's leading people to Christ through that. So, rather than try and drag people away from that, I, I may change the time frame. I may go to a different day. I don't think I'm going to go any later, and I don't think I should go any earlier. I'm going to think about it a little bit, and I'm going to get back to you. But one way or the other, whether it's earlier, later, Tuesday, or Wednesday, we're going to be here with another episode of Vintage Motocross Q&A. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.